All right, we're gonna get after it. My goal is to get us through the next two presentations, ischemic and valvular heart diseases, and then we will probably hit our time and then we'll pick back up tomorrow. Um, but I wanna get through these because I think they're probably pretty high yield for y'all to know. So we're gonna get into ischemic heart disease. I'm gonna make sure I'm not muted. I know I'm recording. Great. <clears throat> so angina, chronic ischemic heart disease and MIs. So angina, it's pretty straightforward. Literally means chest pain due to ischemic myocardium secondary to some type of coronary artery narrowing or spasm. Big thing with angina is to know the three types. Stable, vasospastic, which used to be called um, variant and unstable. So you may see variant angina on there. That's the same as vasospastic, okay? So stable is the secondary to atherosclerosis, by far the most common. I have a table next page, which will help. Vasospastic, which occurs at rest and is secondary to a vasospasm, quartery artery spasm. An unstable, typically when we're here, there's some type of thrombosis or in, with incomplete coronary artery occlusion. When you have unstable angina, you are leading to a heart attack or some type of cardiac event, okay? So looking at the three, uh, you're looking at pain levels. So with stable, it's typically on exertion, resolves with rest. Vasospastic and unstable can occur at rest, but vasospastic is secondary to that coronary artery spasm versus unstable is just random, right? It's due to occlusion. The pain typically is a little bit more um, extreme and unstable angina. No troponin elevation, no actual infarction for any of these angina pectoris conditions. You don't see EKG changes with stable, but vasospastic and unstable, you can see some ST elevation or depression. You may not see any, any EKG changes though. Triggers, um, stable and unstable have the same triggers. Think about atherosclerosis, activity, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Vasospastic is different. Atherosclerosis, activity, heart rate, or blood pressure does not trigger vasospastic angina. It's triggered by cocaine, alcohol, tryptans, and it has a big risk factor of tobacco use. So think about your social history factors triggering that vasospastic angina versus your typical coronary artery disease risk factors triggering your stable or unstable angina. I think that's the best way to separate them in your brain, okay? All three of them obviously have a risk factor with tobacco. That's angina, that's all. Heart, chest pain, know the difference between the three. Stable, resolves with rest. Vasospastic, due to coronary artery spasm. Think about social history as risk factors or etiology. And unstable, does not resolve with rest, kind of leading you up to some type of coronary artery or myocardial infarction. So chronic ischemic heart disease, it almost should have these reversed. We should do MI and then chronic ischemic heart disease, but they're not, so we're going to go with it. Um, chronic ischemic heart disease is essentially the progressive onset of heart failure over many years due to chronic ischemic myocardial damage. So think about this as the end game of after having multiple heart attacks or having congestive heart failure leading to ischemic heart damage over time. So this is kind of your end stage, not what you want your goal to be, but what the goal could be with years of myocardial infarctions or coronary artery disease. You're going to have a certain level or degree of mitochondrial ischemia. And this is gonna be where we see an imbalance between the supply, perfusion, and demand of the heart for oxygenated blood. And we're gonna talk about the supply and demand perfusion situation. When we talk about pulmonary physiology. This will kind of come into view a little bit easier then. It can be called coronary artery disease, but that's a misnomer. These are two kind of separate conditions. Coronary artery disease is in general disease of the coronary arteries, where we see atherosclerotic plaques and we see narrowing of the coronary arteries. This condition, chronic ischemic heart disease, there's actually narrowing to the point that we have ischemic heart damage leading to heart failure. So it's a progression of CAD. Risk factors then are anything that can lead to coronary artery disease. So our typicals, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, MIs, tobacco, alcohol, sedentary lifestyle, age, sad diet, right? Complication. This is the leading cause of death worldwide because it's the end stage of heart attack. It's the end stage of congestive heart failure. Progressive heart failure, progressive CHF here can lead to a heart transplant. So it's probably also one of the most common reasons for a heart transplant. 
The pathogenesis is low, it's long and slow. Typically you won't see symptoms until you start having ischemic heart disease symptoms. So until you have angina or until you actually have your first MI. So you might not actually know that you're starting to develop this condition until it's progressed pretty far. You're gonna see chronic ischemic heart disease typically post-infarction. So most patients don't develop chronic ischemic heart disease until they've had at least one MI, one heart attack, one myocardial infarction. And we see this because there's obviously some decompensation with the heart when the heart tissue dies or necrosis after an infarct. Etiologies, again, reduce blood flow due to some type of obstruction, typically atherosclerotic plaques. Typically an MI, like I said, precedes it. And clinical characteristics that you could see, some scar scars from previous heart attacks, obstructive coronary atherosclerosis, so full obstruction, enlarged heavy heart with left ventricular hypertrophy and dilatation. So you're seeing the heart become larger, the ventricles become bigger and thicker because they're trying to get blood through, but they're having a harder and harder time because there's more heart tissue that's dead or damaged. So myocardial infarction, our heart attack, death of cardiac muscle due to prolonged severe ischemia. Risk factors are the common ones. One to keep in mind that could come up is postmenopausal state due to that drop in estrogen. So I think that one's particularly interesting for females. It'd be a great way to connect a cardiovascular system to like an endocrine or repro system question is talk about the um, relationship between an MI and someone who's postmenopausal. What, you know, what hormone could be involved? Estrogen, what, you know, what process or what place in the brain creates estrogen? We, we could think about all those pathways. So this would be a great connection question if I was writing questions for NCLEX, which I don't right now, um, which I have. Uh, so complications, it can be caught early. Uh, if it's caught early, it's reversible. If it's caught late, it, it results in myocyte death, so heart cell death. So that's a piece to know. It can lead to chronic IHD, ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, or death. But it can be reversed if caught quickly. Um, knowing the complications by time frame is important. So really cute, a quick, uh, like within the first 24 hours, you can see ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure or cardiogenic shock. In about one to three days, that's when you're gonna see your post-infarction pericarditis, which we'll talk about pericarditis here, but about one to three days later is when pericarditis sets in that inflammation of the pericardium. Three to 14 days after, you can see cardiac tamponade, mitral regurge, or even a left ventricular pseudoaneurysm. So you might have some dysfunction in your heart valves pumping the blood the correct way depending on where damage occurred in the heart. And two weeks later is when Dressler syndrome can come in. That's essentially you think about post-MI syndrome, think Dressler syndrome, heart failure, arrhythmias, ventricular aneurysm. So I don't think you'll need to know exactly when these things fall into place, but know the general the processes. Initially, you're gonna see VTAC, V arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure, shock. It's happening right then. You're gonna probably have the most acute things happen right when the heart attack occurs. Within a couple of days, that's when you're seeing inflammation, right? The heart tissue's remodeling, you're gonna see inflammatory changes, so pericarditis can happen. Up to two weeks later, you could have a reinfarct, right? That's a common time. So cardiac tamponade, so complete heart, heart failure, mitral regurg, you're having pr trouble pushing blood the correct way. Your heart's trying to learn how to pump with its new normal, its infarcted tissue. And then two weeks later, that's when you can see kind of more of these long-term chronic effects. So heart failure could come back, a new arrhythmia could crop in, aneurysm could happen because maybe your heart wasn't pumping blood effectively, so you form some clots. So think logically kind of where these things could fall. Pathogenesis, kind of thinking about how a heart attack occurs. The initial event typically, so this is gonna be your most common cause of an MI. 90% of MIs are caused in this pathogenetic process, but there are a few other ways that a heart attack can occur. You could have a heart attack from a clot that comes elsewhere, yada, yada. But this is gonna be the most common way a heart attack is gonna develop in the body. So your initial event, you're gonna have some sudden change in an atheromatous plaque. So some type of atherosclerotic plaque, you're gonna have a sudden change, either a hemorrhage, an erosion, an ulceration, a rupture, some fissure, something about that plaque is going to change. When exposed to that subendothelial collagen, 
and the necrotic plaque contents, so the parts of the plaque that kind of popped off and are dead. Platelets are going to become active, they're going to adhere, and they're going to start releasing their granule contents, and they're going to form that microthrombi. So the body thinks that there's a tear in its vasculature, even though it's a tear in the plaque. So the body's going to do what it does best, try to heal using platelets to clot so that all these microthrombi are created. Once microthrombi are created, vasospasm occurs because platelets release these mediators, spasming the blood vessels to try to encourage blood flow to the area to increase in immune system cells to increase healing, right? It thinks that it has a cut or tear in the vessel when it's a cut or tear in a plaque. Tissue factor is then activated, which increases that coagulation pathway more, adding more bulk to the thrombus. Now we get more and more occlusion, right? That already narrowed part of your artery is now becoming more and more occluded because the body's trying to help. And then within typically minutes, the thrombus involves to completely occlude the lumen of whatever vessel, okay? This is your most common cause of why a heart attack occurs. Leads to ischemia for wherever that artery was and myocyte death that can occur specifically at that location where blood supply was cut off. This is a great time for them to ask about anatomy of vasculature in the heart. So knowing, you know, if they say that an occlusion occurred at the left circumflex artery, knowing what area of the heart that could cut off blood supply to would be important. Or what part of the, what, um, if they said it was up higher, right? The left anterior descending knowing what's below that, that could then become occluded, right? These would be really good anatomy questions. So again, this is your complications. If you're a mnemonic person, Darth Vader is your myocardial infarction complications, death, arrhythmia, rupture, tamponade, heart failure, valve disease, aneurysm, Dressler syndrome, embolism, recurrence, regurgitation. Pretty much everything bad, right? Most bad, big bad heart conditions can occur after a heart attack. So what's some biochemistry within a heart attack? Um, you have, once you have loss of blood flow to an area, you're gonna have cessation of aerobic metabolism within seconds of that loss of blood flow, which means inadequate production of ATP, which means accumulation of lactic acid because your body goes through an alternative pathway to try to still continue to be able to produce some form of energy. So lactic acid, other kind of bad metabolic products will build up. All things not great happening within that area of your heart tissue, all decreasing to not have a good adequate muscle, heart muscle contraction. Your microscopy of an MI, within one day, there's kind of these wavy fibers. There's these dark eosinophilic stripes. It's essentially how do we form a scar, right? Then you have coagulative necrosis. Neutrophils come in saying, hey, there's an inflammation here. Then macrophages come in and kind of mop up the neutrophils and all the products of stuff, granulation tissues formed, and then you see a scar. Very similar to normal scar formation. If you know, understand kind of how a scar is formed, it's very similar within the heart tissue. Probably the most important thing to understand would be understanding the difference between an end STEMI and STEMI. I think there's typically always a question or two about this. So both of them can occur with pain at rest. Both of them are gonna have elevated troponin levels. The difference is really the layers involved and how it looks on EKG. So with an end STEMI, you're gonna have it, the sub endocardium is gonna be involved, which is the inner one third of the heart tissue that's especially vulnerable to ischemia, okay? This is more likely the type of heart attack to occur. You could think of it as a less bad heart attack. It's still a bad heart attack, it's still a heart attack, but it's the inner one third, more susceptible. Versus a STEMI is transmural, meaning it's the full thickness of myocardial wall is affected. So when you hear of, oh, someone's having a STEMI, you rush them to the cath lab because you're trying to open up those vessels as soon as possible because you have full wall thickness tissue death versus just inner wall tissue death with an end STEMI. The difference is you'll see ST depression with an end STEMI, ST elevation, and maybe some Q waves with a STEMI. STEMI is literally ST elevation myocardial infarction. End STEMI is no ST elevation myocardial infarction. That's what they stand for. So if you understand what that acronym stands for, you'll know if it has ST elevation or depression. ST elevation, think full thickness. Your common arteries 
your left anterior descending, your right coronary artery, and your circumflex are your three most common in that order. Left anterior descending, most commonly affected artery for an MI. Right coronary artery is next, and then your circumflex is third. Yes? Yes, absolutely. They could use that. I don't think they'll probably refer to it as that in your test. I think that would be your Widowmaker artery would be your LAD. Absolutely. Thank you. Good question. They most of the time won't, occur, won't use that type of terminology on our NPLEX exam. They will use an acronym potentially if it's on the abbreviations list that's in the NPLEX study guide. Otherwise, they'll list out the full name. For most of these arteries, they'll list out the full name for you, which is helpful. And semi stemmy they will put acronym for sure. Females, you may have none, no symptoms. Males, you may have symptoms or you might have symptoms in both, right? It's a misnomer that there's less symptoms in a female than a male. I've seen males have silent heart attacks. I've seen females have silent heart attacks. I've seen them both have symptomatic heart attacks. So don't let that trick you. Nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, chest pain, left arm, jaw, shortness of breath, fatigue, all those things. Okay, let's practice. Let's do some practice. Get your ABCDs ready. Yes, LAD, Widowmaker. I was checking myself. <laughs> All right, so we ready? Okay, no, okay, well, we're gonna do it anyways. Okay, so whether you're ready or not, we're gonna come. Okay, changes in blood pressure are sensed by baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. The carotid sinus is innervated primarily by the facial nerve, hypoglossal nerve, Glossopharyngeal nerve, sympathetic chain ganglia. Nothing to do with what we've been talking about. Oh no. But it is, because our 50 year old presents with episodes of edema, shortness of breath, and uncontrolled hypertension. All right, what nerve innervates those barrow or carotid sinus? We have a lot of C's, we have some D's. C's and D's is our mix. Which one is it? Do we want to duke it out? No? It is C, glossopharyngeal nerve. We will do some nerve study when we get to the nervous system. But our glossopharyngeal nerve innervates that carotid sinus. Those baroreceptors are there. Again, a question you didn't even have to read the vignette to know, right? So what about this? Ion channels play a key role in stabilizing blood pressure. What is the principal cation found in intracellular fluid which is beneficial in the treatment of hypertension. The main cation, cat T plus, found in intracellular fluid. We should all know this one. We've talked many, we've talked about ions all day. Oh yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Main intracellular cation is potassium. Sodium is outside. Calcium doesn't get to hang. Calcium does come inside and it is in your sarcoplasmic reticulum but potassium is by far the major player here. It can also be used as a treatment for hypertension. Zinc, sorry, you're awesome, but not involved. Okay. In addition to increasing sympathetic output and mineral corticoid secretion, how does the renin angiotensin aldosterone system elevate systemic blood pressure? Again, we haven't even talked about this yet, but you know. How does it do it? It increases blood volume. It decreases sodium retention. It decreases atrial nitretic peptide, or it causes direct systemic vasoconstriction. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We're going to talk all about this in the kidneys. You're going to hate it, but it's going to be great. I feel love it. I think it's great. I love this system. If you said A, that was a good guess, but it causes direct systemic vasoconstriction is the answer they're looking for. Because what we're talking about is how does it elevate systemic blood pressure? You can see increased blood volume, especially from aldosterone, but it is going to cause direct systemic vasoconstriction from increasing your sympathetic output, right? Oh, tricky, tricky. This one would probably get thrown out, I feel like, on an exam because A and D feel really good, like pretty good answers to me. Okay, last one. This one. I'll tell you how to answer this in a second. 
When released from the vasorecta of the kidney, which protein initiates and the angiotensin cascade? Renin, vasopressin, angiotensin 1, angiotensinogen. We got some A's, we got some others. Do we have other answers? Some D's, yep. We got some B's, we got some C's. No E's, which is good. That's not an option. It's renin. How do I know this? Because every time you hear that system listed, it's the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Renin comes first. The question before that, this was a vignette. The question before that said the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And then the next question said, which one comes first? They're not trying to trick you. So if you feel like, wow, did they just give me the answer? They probably did because they're not, each person isn't, it's not typically one person writing all the vignette questions. It's different people writing the questions for one vignette. So one question could give you an answer to another question without you knowing it because there's a totally different question writer. So don't, don't, like I said, don't overcomplicate things. All right. Ischemic heart disease, know your heart attacks. I want to get into, I want to do valvular. I think we'll have time for this and then we'll, we'll call it. All right, cardiopath, valvular diseases, some heart murmurs, endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, and then carcinoids. There will be questions about endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, and probably mitral valve prolapse. I don't think there's ever been an NPLEX that hasn't had those on there. Um, they just love it. All right, so some heart murmurs. Aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency and regurgitation. Aortic stenosis is in your systolic system. Chris, a crescendo, decrescendo, ejection murmur. You can think about uh, some other clinical characteristics they could talk about as pulsus parvus and tardis, essentially a weak pulse. A soft S2 and ejection click. I would say probably the most common description of aortic stenosis is a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. So systolic murmur, stenosis, having trouble opening the aortic valve. Etiology, age can be a big one, or bicuspid aortic valve is probably your most common genetic or congenital malformation that can lead to this. So bicuspid aortic valve. In fact, a lot of these valvular issues, if you have a bicuspid aortic valve, it sets you up for many of them. So when in doubt, bicuspid aortic valve, if it's dealing with the aorta, not a bad guess. Um, then of course, age, osteosclerosis, and bicuspid aortic valve are your risk factors. Complication, SAD, which is syncope, angina, and dyspnea on exertion. That would be sad to have all those things. Uh, left ventricular pressure is less than the aortic pressure during systole. You're having a hard time opening that valve, getting that valve open. So complications, issues with having to increase your heart's contractility, increasing your, your um, force of contraction. So you could have left-sided ventricular hypertrophy you could then lead to your heart muscle getting too thick, too big, less blood is able to fill those ventricles. You have less than blood flowing through your system. Your heart continues to work harder and harder. It can lead to heart attacks, CHF, coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease. On the other hand, aortic insufficiency or regurgitation, diastolic murmur, an early diastolic decrescendo, kind of a high pitch blowing murmur. You'll have a wider pulse pressure. One of the kind of pathognomonics is like a pistol shot femoral pulse. It comes out as like a zing, it's really, it's very taut. Or a pulsating nail bed. But I would say probably the best thing to remember with aortic insufficiency or regurge would be bare, which is your etiology. So a bicuspid aortic valve, endocarditis, aortic root dilatation or rheumatic fever. Those are your main causes or etiologies of aortic insufficiency or regurgitation. Complication most commonly is left-sided CHF. So blood's flowing back into the heart from the aorta. It's not closing completely. Your other main heart murmurs you need to know, they don't list every single heart murmur on that you could have on your exam. So it's only aortic and mitral that they really care that you know. Mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur. And I have, again, in case if you're forgetting, I have a heart here so you can see kind of where those valves are. It's gonna follow your opening snap. It's kind of this delayed, rumbling, mid to late murmur. Your big etiology or risk factor is rheumatic fever. 
we'll talk about. Complications left atrial dilatation. So your atria is going to bubble out, get bigger. Pulmonary congestion, blood flowing kind of, blood kind of not being able to get through, so flowing back. Atrial fibrillation, AFib. Ortner syndrome, which isn't on your list. Hemoptysis or right-sided CHF. You're gonna have left atrial pressure is gonna be greater than your ventricular pressure. So it's gonna have a harder time opening. All right, now our mitral insufficiency and our mitral valve prolapse. I have these together because they're both systolic murmurs. Mitral insufficiency is gonna be like mitral regurg, okay? So you're gonna have a holosystolic, high-pitched blowing murmur. If you hear holosystolic murmur, think mitral regurg and mitral insufficiency. Your most common causes is ischemic heart disease, so like post-MI mentioned. Mitral valve prolapse can cause mitral regurg. Uh, left ventricular dilatation, rheumatic fever, or infective endocrinitis. So think things that can happen to valves could cause mitral regurg. Mitral valve prolapse is this late crescendo murmur with this mid-systolic click. So if you hear a mid-systolic click, Murmur with mid systolic click, think MVP, mitral valve prolapse. It can be completely benign in some people, or it can set you up to get infective endocarditis. So it could be benign or it can set you up for, you know, getting an infection potentially on the, your endocardial infection. Etiologies could be rheumatic fever, cord eruption, primary or secondary connective tissue diseases, which is the myzomatous degeneration, kind of some random stuff. But think again, things that happen to the valve, mitral valve prolapse, this is the prolapsing of the mitral valve on itself. So then obviously if you have a prolapsed valve that's not shutting efficiently, you can get regurg. That's why these are related together. So now the big kahuna, endocarditis. Endocarditis has two kind of major types, infective and non-infective or non-bacterial. Infective endocarditis is the infection of the endocardial surface of the heart. It typically involves one or more heart valves. That's why it's in the valvular diseases. Typically at least one heart valve is involved in endocarditis. You can also see non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. There, this is more rare. Typically, you're going to see it affecting the mitral or the aortic valve if this is occurring. And you're going to see sterile, platelet-rich thrombi that dislodge easily. So this would be on the actual valves themselves, these thrombi that are platelet-rich, more of a clotting or hypercoagulability disorder. The vegetations don't have any bacteria in them, the actual growth on the valves, but they can cause similar symptomatology. Much more rare. Primarily, I would focus on infective endocarditis, but know that there is a non-infective type. So if you asked that question, you would know that is true. So with our infective endocarditis, bacteria is much more common than fungi. So you're most likely going to see this being a bacterial infection, although you could have a viral or a fungal infection. Typically, your most common organism in acute infective endocarditis is going to be Staph aureus. So when in doubt, choose Staph aureus for your acute infective endocarditis. These are going to be large destructive vegetations or growths on normal, healthy valves. It's going to be rapid onset. So if you have a healthy person who presents with some type of vegetation or valvular disease and you're concerned about an infection and their valves are normal, think Staph aureus. Now, if you have subacute endocarditis, Think strep viridans. This is typically smaller vegetations, and these are on valves that are either congenitally abnormal or they have some type of disease. And this is more of a gradual onset. The major risk factor, this is huge, is dental procedures. So if you have a, this is, I've seen this, I don't know, I feel like this comes up all the time, like on every test. Subacute, infective endocarditis, the person's just had a dental procedure in the vignette, think subacute strep viridans, okay, before anything else. Now, there are many other bacteria that can affect the valves. And so if there's a prosthetic valve, staph epidermidis may be your effector. A GI or GU procedure, enterococcus, right, comes from the gut. Colon cancer, strep bovis, now gallolyticus, 
IV drug use, Staph aureus on the skin, Pseudomonas or Candida. Culture negative, Coxella or Bartonella. I doubt they would include that. Or gram negative, HAC is your common gram negatives. That's an acronym to remember your gram negative bacteria. Haemophilus, Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinella, and Kingella. By far, Haemophilus and Actinobacillus are probably the most common ones that they would use. But I'd say on this list, if you had to point a few, I would know this one prosthetic valves, that's fun, the GIGU, and then the IV. Those would be the ones that I would really try to commit to memory if you had to, besides your Staph aureus and your Strep viridam. So how do we recognize this clinically? This is actually probably one of the most need to know acronyms. So from Jane. So in infective endocarditis, there's a lot of really good test questions on clinical characteristics. So fever, broth spots, ocular nodes, murmurs, Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhages, and emboli. What do those look like? We will look at them. So septic embolism is, these are the vascular phenomena. So septic embolism, petechiae, non-blanching spots on the body, splinter hemorrhages, that's nail bed hemorrhages, Janeway lesions, immune complex deposition. You sometimes see this in the eyes actually, or the kidneys. Lumen and nephritis, kidneys, Osler's nodes, really painful nodes on the hands and rough spots. You won't have to identify them. They're not gonna give you a picture, but know that if you see any of these words, associate them with an infective endocarditis. There's no pictures on the exam, um, but they will often include some of these things hidden within. They probably will, they would most likely include them as your patient's been diagnosed with infective endocarditis. What are you most likely to see on clinical exam? And they'll give you a couple options. They'll probably have like two things per question. And each question will have like one right and one that's not right. So you'll wanna be looking for one that contains two components from this list of from Jane. They like to um, confuse infective carditis and rheumatic fever a lot. They like to confuse infective carditis, endocarditis with some of your connective tissue diseases or autonomic nervous system diseases or immune conditions. Um, so make sure I would say you understand from Jane and what each of those pieces are when it comes to infective endocarditis. Your most common valve is gonna be mitral, more than aortic, but they both could be affected. Tricuspid typically is associated with IV drugs. Don't try drugs, TRI, tricuspid. Endothelial injury from these bacteria leads to formation of vegetations that consist of platelets, fibrin, and the actual bacteria on the heart valves themselves. And complications are typically valve regurgitation or emboli. And obviously sepsis, blood infection. So the non-bacterial clinical characteristics typically asymptomatic non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis until you have an embolism, then it's symptomatic. Risk factors is gonna be any hypercoagulable state. So thinking malignancy like cancer, SLE, so lupus, or any other state where you might be more hypercoagulable, whether it's medications or something that you're taking or something that you're doing. They're not gonna test farm on this one. So I would say cancer or lupus are probably gonna be your big two if you see that. And they're saying that they're, they're noticed vegetations on the heart valves. And what could it be? Maybe lean towards the non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Especially if they say asymptomatic. Okay. So rheumatic heart disease. This is an immune-mediated type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So you have antibodies to M proteins that cross-react with self-antigens, often your own myosin proteins. The etiology is from an infection, a pharyngeal infection with group A beta hemolytic strep. That's why we care so much about treating strep throat. It's not because we want to give antibiotics to the world, but it's because that there are some complications like rheumatic heart disease that could occur in some people. So again, 
it is not a direct effect of the bacteria, but the etiology starts with this pharyngeal infection with group A beta hemolytic strep. And then in some people, they can have an immune mediated type two hypersensitivity reaction where they have antibodies to the M protein that cross react with their antibodies to self, typically myosin, which can cause full body effects, but you can see it specifically in the heart, right? Because why would you think hearts contracting constantly? constantly having to use that myosin actin process to do its, do its job. So there's a lot of effects that can happen right there locally. Complications, earlier valve re, early valve regurgitation, late valve stenosis, that's interesting. So early on, you can have issues with valves backflowing and later on, once actual vegetation inflammation fibrosis occurs, you can have stenosis, so valves becoming too stiff. What's the pathogenesis? It's gonna affect heart valves, mitral, aortic, and tricuspid. That's why MAT was highlighted on the last slide. So when I think of, I can't reach my little dot. When I think of what valves are gonna be affected, let me go back, I think MAT, mitral first, aortic next, tricuspid after. So most of the time, mitral and aortic the most, but tricuspid can be affected, but much less. Pulmonic typically is spared. Your big pathognomonic here would be ash-off bodies. So if you see ash-off bodies, those are granulomas that have giant cells, or anti-scoff or anti scow cells are enlarged macrophages with this ovoid, wavy, rod-like nucleus. It's kind of this like oval that looks a little bit like this. I have as much drawing as you'll get from me. You can typically see increased anti streptolysin O, increased anti DNA B titers. This probably won't be asked. It might be included in the vignette, but likely wouldn't help you. But Ashoff and anti scowl cells, these could be things that they would ask you about when it comes to rheumatic heart disease. So, again, most commonly I see people switch rheumatic heart disease and endocarditis. Remember, Janeway lesion, so from Jane, endocarditis, ash off bodies, and antiscow cells, rheumatic heart disease. So separate them yourself, both valvular conditions, right? So some clinical characteristics. Again, this is why people get them confused because we have Jones here, Jones with a heart. So these are the major criteria for rheumatic heart disease, joint, so migratory polyarthritis, heart, which is your O, which is carditis, nodules in your skin that are subcutaneous, kind of mimicking, right? Some things that we saw previously. Erythema, erythema marginatum, which is this rash that kind of has a ring margin, and Sydenham chorea, which is these kind of like ticks, these movements of your face or your limbs, right? So these would be Jones criteria for rheumatic heart disease. Keep Jones and from Jane separate in your brain. The last valvular lesion is carcinoid heart disease. This is probably unlikely to pop up, but I wanna talk about it nonetheless, just to be thorough. It's gonna be the cardiac manifestation of a systemic syndrome caused by carcinoid tumors. So you can have carcinoid tumors all over. About 50% of people that have carcinoid tumors have it affects their heart, specifically their heart valves. Typically, you're going to see valves being involved on the right side of the heart, as well as the endocardium. And you can see these cardiac lesions that are firm, plaque-like, fibrous thickenings inside the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. They contain smooth muscle cells and collagen. Symptoms you can have occur flushing, cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And most of the time, you're going to see tricuspid insufficiency, which then follows by pulmonic insufficiency. So my big thing with carcinoid heart disease, it's the one valvular condition that affects the right side of the heart. So yeah, right side of the heart more than the left, okay? So that would be your big takeaway. Occurs due to tumors located elsewhere throughout the body. It's a systemic symptom, syndrome that affects heart tissue specifically. All right. We did it. Oh, we might have time to zoom in to start one more before I let you go. We're gonna do it. That was valves. 
I have a timer, don't worry, I will let you out on time. All right, our last path that we'll get through to today, we'll try to get through a few, primary myocardial diseases. These are your cardiomyopathies, so dilated, restrictive, hypertrophic, and myocarditis. So the three types of cardiomyopathy, dilated is most common. This is dilation of cardiac chambers. So think about ventricles specifically. Ventricles becoming dilated. Hypertrophic is the second most common. Think of enlargement of the cardiac muscle surrounding the ventricles. So it's not instead of dilated, it's enlarged. That's cardiomyopathy. Restrictive is known as infiltrative. And you're thinking about decreased ventricular compliance. So stuff that's filling up around the muscle around those ventricles to make them so they're less able to contract effectively. Okay, that's how I define them in my brain. So when you're thinking about dilated cardiomyopathy, it can be idiopathic, meaning it doesn't have a known cause. It could be genetic. It could be due to drugs. It could be due to infection. It could be due to ischemia. It could be systemic. It could be due to peripartum cardiomyopathy. So all kinds of fun causes, right? How do we suss out the differences? I would say the big important pieces with dilated cardiomyopathy aren't as much the cause or the etiology, but what's actually going on with the heart tissue. How can you separate it from the other two types of cardiomyopathy? We'll talk a little bit more about what are the clinical characteristics? What does this look like? So in dilated cardiomyopathy, you can see this here, the actual muscle tissue itself is normal in size, but the ventricle is enlarged. It's ballooned. You can have clinical characteristics like congestive heart failure with an S3 sound. You could have a systolic regurgitation murmur. You would see dilated heart that has this balloon-like appearance on x-ray. This is referred to as eccentric hypertrophy. So sarcomeres are added in series. So if there's one thing to know would be that cardiomyopathy that's dilated is eccentric hypertrophy. And it's going to have a balloon-like appearance on your chest x-ray. Systolic dysfunction is going to be your main complication. So it's going to affect your body's ability to eject blood out of the heart. The heart, the, the ventricle itself is larger, it's ballooned, so you're going to have a harder time contracting effectively enough to get blood out and eject into the aorta because you have a longer distance to go, right? It's ballooned out. You have a bigger amount to contract in to really push that blood out. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, on the other hand, there is a large familial autosomal dominant component so there is a large genetic component. It also could be due to chronic hypertension. But I would say, say when you hear about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, think genetic first, and then you could think about maybe chronic hypertension or things that cause the heart muscle to have to pump and enlarge. Your clinical characteristics for this one is you're going to have an S4 sound. So S3 for dilated, S4 for hypertrophic, and mitral regurg. This, you're going to see a concentric hypertrophy. Sacromeres are added in parallel versus in series. That's gonna be your difference. You could have some dyspnea and you're seeing a diastolic dysfunction. There's less room for the heart, the ventricle to be filled. There's less room for blood to flow in. You have less ability for the heart to fill with blood, less blood that's moving through the heart at any one given pump. There's less space. And then restrictive, the least common, your etiology is please help. So post-radiation fibrosis, Loeffler endocarditis, endocardial fibroelastosis, this is seen more in children, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, oops, hemochromatosis is your help. I would say when thinking about cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, think about any condition that could potentially put infiltrates into that heart tissue. So that's why amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, that makes sense, hemochromatosis, iron deposits, stuff that fill up tissue with things, with infiltrate. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is doing just that. It's making it more restrictive, less able to do its job, so we can see low voltage EKG, that's a G. We can see complications that are diastolic in nature. 
So three main differences, dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive cardiomyopathy, dilated heart muscle, the ventricle itself is ballooned. It's going to cause systolic dysfunction. Sarcomeres are added in series. It's going to have a harder time pumping blood out. That's why it's systolic dysfunction. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, heart muscle is going to be thickened and large. There's less room for blood to go in that ventricle because the muscle itself is thickened and large. You're going to have diastolic dysfunction because less blood is actually able to fill up into that heart itself. So less blood's being pumped through the system. Sarcomeres are laid in parallel. And then restrictive or infiltrative cardiomyopathy. You're neither ballooning nor enlarging, but you're having that outside muscle tissue being filled up with infiltrates of some kind. The muscle itself is less compliant, less contractile. Okay, that's how you separate the three, those three. And then we finish with myocarditis. Myocarditis is inflammation of that myocardium. Definition is it's going to be your global enlargement of the heart and dilation of all chambers. This is commonly the most common cause of sudden cardiac death, SCD. It's the most common complication of this. You can also see arrhythmias, heart blocks, dilated cardiomyopathy, because everything's dilated, right? CHF, thrombus with systemic emboli. Clinical characteristics can look very much like almost congestive heart failure or CD, dyspnea, chest pain, fever is interesting because it is an inflammatory condition, and arrhythmia is typically tachycardia. And if you can have it be infectious in nature. So if viral and etiology, you will see lymphocytic infiltrates with local death to tissue, focal necrosis, that's what that means. So what are some causes? So viral, you have your adenovirus, Coxsackie, Parvo, HIV, HHV6, parasitic causes. You have bacterial causes that are different than endocarditis, right? Borrelia, mycoplasma, corneobacterium, diphtheriae. So helpful to know the differences. What are different bacterial causes for myocarditis versus endocarditis? Toxins like carbon monoxide poisoning, black widow venom, rheumatic fever, drugs like cocaine, or autoimmune conditions. They love testing you on weird like bites and animal things. So I wouldn't put it past them to have black widow venom as a component. So just tuck that one away. We had a leprosy question once that had like a weird animal vector. So anytime they have some animal vector type thing, I would tuck that nugget away in your brain. Might get you a question or two. And I think we'll stop at pericarditis for today. So we have a couple, we have one minute left. All right. So we made it through today almost half the conditions of the cardiovascular system. You made it through cardiovascular physiology and you learned how to take a test if you already knew how. Tomorrow, we're going to start with an exam. So we're going to come in. You're going to get seated. I'm going to have an exam for you in a Scantron. You'll fill it out just like you would your exam on your NPLEX day. It'll be short. Um, you'll have an hour, so you'll be given 50 questions, okay? Oh, about 50. It might be like 49 or 52, okay? We will go over the exam after, and you'll be given the answer key online on the Moodle page afterwards, and then we'll, we'll continue on. Awesome. Thank you. Go forth and be amazing. Send your questions online. If, or you can ask them now and I will answer them tomorrow after our test.